Joshua 1.1, 1, 1. after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Listen to this promise. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land that I have given you. Wow, what a promise. You ever think of that? Walking in faith, walking in obedience, wherever you place your foot, the blessings of God will be there. You can claim it by the word of God. Joshua 1.10. Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready. In three days, you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, he just said, I'm going to give you wherever you set your foot, and I'm going to give you this promised land. Joshua 3, if you want to turn over there to verse 11. Joshua 3.11 says, I'm reading from the New Living. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Read on in 12. Now, chose, now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priest will carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream, and the river will stand up like a wall. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan, and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the Ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan, and the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Father, we pray that you will let this live in us, this word that you have spoken. Thank you, Father, for your word. Now we ask that it come alive to give us faith for the future. Knowledge of your word and what you will do in our lives. Challenge us with this, Father. And then bless us to live this out. We want to be doers of the word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name. Well, we all know the story. Because of unbelief and disobedience, Israel had been in the wilderness for 40 years. An 11-day trip, 40 years it took them. Now their time has expired there and now they're ready to enter the promised land, Canaan land. Moses had died. Joshua was in charge. Now they come to the critical moment. This is the crisis moment. Anybody ever had a crisis moment in your life? As a lot of you lied right then. You didn't raise your hand. We've all had them. And this is where you decide if the dream and the vision is worth it. This is where you either break down or break through. This is where you see things happen or you see things not happening. One thing to dream, it's another thing to take possession of the dream and to move forward into that dream. So now the children of Israel are here and they're ready at the edge of the water to claim their inheritance, this land of promise. All the doubters had died off. I said all the doubters had died off. All the doubters were gone. I mean, know that doubters can confuse and upset your life to the point where you can't have the promises of God. I would say that you need to, one way or another, rid yourself of the doubters in your life. Um, maybe you need to change your friends. Uh, maybe you need to have a, uh, a prayer meeting with those folks that you choose to stay with and say, look, we're not going to doubt anymore. We're not going to confess doubt anymore. We're going to move forward and we're not going to be negative. We're going to believe the word of God. There was a major obstacle and there always is. Before they could get to the promised land, they had to cross this obstacle called the Jordan River. I think every dreamer comes to the place where there's only two choices left. One, cross over into the promises of God by faith. Two, settle down on this side and be comfortable. Give up your dream. Give up your vision. Give up the promise of God. Too many people have done that. 
The Jordan is a place that God always ordains for every life, every one of us. It's a place of impossibility. It's a place of weakness. It's a place of helplessness. It's a place where we can't figure out what to do, where all self-effort and flesh effort dies. We come face to face with our carnal selves and we realize that we can't do this on our own. You, maybe you faced your Jordan or facing it now through a time of sickness or financial difficulty or maybe family turmoil or marriage trouble. So your Jordan is the dividing line. It's a place where we're forced to decide, am I going to continue to follow God or am I going to settle down here and release the fact of vision and promise? Am I going to let it go? Am I going to become comfortable? Question is, are you going to trust the living God? Are you going to trust in the arm of flesh and self-effort? Are you going to keep moving forward? Are you going to go where you can't go in your own strength? We've got to have big faith and big obedience. That's what we've got to have. You can't make this happen on your own. It will never happen. No one lets go of where they are and what they have until they've caught a vision of something else. Trapeze artist will never let go of the bar he's swinging on. If he doesn't let go, he can't have that other bar. And as long as he's just swinging you, how many know it finally comes to a stop? It's where the devil wants you. He wants you to come to a stop. But once you've given, been given the, the vision of a promised land, once you've grabbed hold of that vision, you won't stop. Once you've seen what God wants you to see, that's what I believe 2020 is going to be all about. Catching the vision of the promise of God so that we clearly see what we've not been able to see before. What is 2020 vision? It's perfect vision. I believe that's what God wants for us to have. Now the Jordan River normally was only about 100 feet wide. It was about, uh, it was probably less than the Taney Como where we used to live. 100 feet is not that far. You know, it, just, it was just kind of a wide creek, really. But it seems that God always does things in a way that pushes us out of our comfort zone into a place where we have to believe Him, where we can't do it on our own. Let's go back and read Joshua 3.15. It said, It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, what happened? God began to move. As long as you're standing on the dry ground and saying, Oh God, send me money. Oh God, fix my marriage. Oh God, help my health. Oh God. And you're not willing to use faith to step into the raging river. And say, God, I'm going to go forward and I'm going to trust you. As long as you stand there, you won't make it. There won't be dry ground to walk on. Now, at this harvest season, this is the time when that little creek sw was swollen to over a mile wide. You talk about the flood. We experienced a couple of those. You know, Cheryl did too. Uh, that's not fun. It's, it's nice to be on the lake, but it's not good to be in the lake. And that's where we ended up. This is where these people were. When, when Israel arrived to the banks of the Jordan, it was over 50 times normal size. Now, that will test your faith, folks. Those are the moments. There's no way they could cross the river on their own. They, they, they needed something bigger than themselves. They needed God. I mean, the significance of the Ark of the Covenant is shown here. They would either cross the river with God's help, or they would stay on the side where the wilderness was. Symbol of God's presence and power. Joshua 3, 3 said, when you see, telling the people of Israel, we didn't read this before, but we'll read it now. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, move out from your positions and follow them. So God said, wait on the Ark. Wait on the provision of God. Wait on the promise of God. Wait till you see and you know that God has spoken. You find that in the Word of God in our day. When they... When they moved, they were to move only when God moved. When they stopped, they were to stop when God stopped. They were to focus their eyes on God, not on the challenge ahead of them. Crossing the Jordan will require you to leave your comfort zone. It will require you to use faith that maybe you've never used before. Israel followed the presence of God. Listen to me now. What did the ark represent? It was the symbol of the presence of God. If you go back and study the ark, you find that it was his presence that was carried in that ark. The very presence of God. What do we experience in mornings like this and times like this? And we worship Him and feel His presence 
come into this room and I feel his presence in this place right now. I know that he's here with us. I know that he, he's challenging you by his Holy Spirit to hear what is being said from his word. A lot of people say, well, that's okay, God. Uh, that looks pretty dangerous. I think I'll just stay where I am. I think I'll settle here. If they had only considered the circumstances, they would have never gone to the promised land. They would have never grabbed hold of the promises of God. Joshua 3, 6. In the morning, Joshua said to the priests, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. The Lord told Joshua, today, I'll begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They'll know that I'm with you, just as I was with Moses. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan, take a few steps into the river and pause. Just wait. Just stop there. We honor God by doing what He says, by doing exactly what He said. Go back to Jericho. Once they got into the Promised Land, this is a whole other story. They did exactly what God said when they marched around. They followed instructions exactly, specifically. Joshua told the people to consecrate yourselves. <clears throat> he said, for tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Consecrate yourselves. Purify yourselves. How do we get to the place where God wants us to be? We purify our hearts. We lay aside those things. What are these seven days of devotion next week, starting next week, supposed to do? Consecrate. Purify. Obey God. Listen to Him. Hear Him speak. God said to watch Him. To follow Him. To honor Him. And we honor God by seeing and doing exactly what He has said for us to do. The word consecrate means to be made clean or holy. Consecration is having that pure heart, that clear conscience, accompanied by faith and obedience. There's nothing that's impossible to those who are consecrated before the Lord, who use their faith. It's presumptuous of us, I think, to think that just because we've been saved by God's grace that, that everything is going to work out. We can live our, way, our lives in, in any way we choose and that it'll all just work out fine. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 12. I was baptized when I was 13. And, you know, I'm okay now for the rest of forever and I can do whatever I want to. Consecration comes from separating yourself from the world and crucifying the flesh. We sang the song earlier about, I love you, Lord. I lift my voice. And it says, uh, I, I, my soul sings, my soul. What's your soul? Mind, emotions, and will. My spirit begins to join in when my soul sings. Next week, from the 5th through that following Saturday, next week should be a week of consecration, of soul singing, so that spirit can sing as well. The younger generation of the Israelites were about to go into the land of promise. The older generation had never really separated themselves from Egypt. Their flesh was out away from Egypt, but their minds and their hearts. It was only 45 days after they crossed the Red Sea that they sat together and said, oh, if we were just back in Egypt, back in slavery, at least we would have had meat to eat. At least we would have had comfortable surroundings. Even though they were beating us and killing us, we'd take that over this stepping out in faith and not being sure of where we're going. What that's saying is, I'd rather be comfortable in slavery than free following God. There are a lot of people like that in our world today. Joshua 3.14. So the people left their camp, their comfortable place, to cross the Jordan. And the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. And as we've already read, the harvest season was there and the banks were overflowing, but God had a plan. But there's always a catch to God's plan. You notice that? That's interesting, isn't it? So only when the priests stepped into the water, only when they took the step toward their problem, only as David did when they ran toward the giant, did God begin to work. Only then will he work in your behalf as well. Let me, let me tell you, there's a lot of folks who do a lot of praying and they're just throwing things up in the air, and they're just hoping that God will answer some of these. If I pray enough prayers, if I put enough words into it, surely God will answer something, and I'll get better. Uh, my life will be better. True faith obeys the Word. True faith finds its answers through the Word of God. Where does faith come from? 
Faith comes by hearing the word of God, knowing the word of God, experiencing the word of God. So we got to stop playing games and we got to stop placing blame and we got to stop retreating and stop backing down. It's time for us to step up into God's will and know God's will by the power of his word and understand what it says and then do what it says. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. What a lesson for us. Too often we just... Too often we just want the Lord to do everything for us. Well, I'm a Christian. I don't need to put any effort into this. I don't need to use my faith, my obedience. I mean, I'm, I'm his child. We sang it this morning. I'm a child of God. There's a place for me in the house of God. I'll come and go when I want to. I'll go once a month and that'll be enough. I, you know, we, we, we kind of live a smorgasbord spiritual life these days. Uh, people go to church if they feel like it. They don't go if they don't feel like it. They get up and test the wind and if something's going on that I'd rather do I go there and I do that and you know I need time with my family anyway and God's God's got to take second place to, to a little time with my family and I'm, I'm telling you here's here's my priority list number one is my relationship with God number two is my wife my family number three is my church number four would be the job which is my church <laughs> but but that that comes forth and that should be that priority for all of you we have to honor God in that way for God to do what he wants to do in our lives. We don't want to have to make the tough decisions. We don't want to have to be still and listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit and get quiet and, and listen to him talk to us. We don't want to have to exercise faith. We just want God to do it. We just want God to be Santa Claus. We just come through this season where if you're a good person and you do okay, then you're going to better get a bunch of gifts from God. It's never about what, what we can do. It's about what he does because we're willing to follow him and obey him and love him and praise him and worship him. Amen. Ephesians 3 20 says now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in the pastor. No, according to the power that works in my prayer partner. No, according to the power that works in me. Where did I get that power? I get that power from walking with God, having a relationship, learning what the Word of God says, strengthening, strengthening my spiritual muscles, strengthening my spiritual muscles. How do I do that? I do that by staying in the Word. I do that by staying on my knees. I do that by doing what God's Word said. See, when the Israelites showed their obedience, God acted in, by their faith and acted in their behalf. What we un misunderstand sometimes is we think that because we're just pretty good people, we don't have to do, really do all that? Really do that stuff? Do I have to do that? Yeah. You have to do your faith. Faith is a verb. Oh, I know it's a noun too, but it's a verb the way I use it. It's an active part of my life. It's a daily thing. Carol and I call on the name of the Lord daily. And we say, God, our help, strengthen us. God, our life, our children, our family, create in them those things that we cannot create on our own. Help them to make right decisions. Help our children and our grandchildren. Help our brothers and our sisters and our families. Help all of us to do exactly what you want us to do so that we can follow in obedience the Word of God and, your, and then our faith will, will be seen as that that has created this miraculous lifestyle. I said miraculous lifestyle. That should be our goal. It never should be outside the, the parameters of our daily thinking that God will not create a miracle for me today. Now, we use miracles in, in a lot of senses. Oh, look, that's why, why you got a new car. Well, that's a miracle. No, wait a minute. Uh, or, or, you know, I love your new dress. Well, yeah, well, it just, just was a miracle. I found it. No, look, a miracle will bring glory to God. That's the purpose. Every miracle in the Word of God brought glory to God. And it does that same thing today. We use the word flippantly, but we should not. When we act upon our faith, when we live in obedience, we should then expect miraculous things to happen in our lives on a daily basis. 
that bring glory to God, that are a testimony to His greatness. It's a terrible thing to know your destiny and what God's called you to do and to miss it. Don't forfeit your destiny by not using your faith or by refusing to live in obedience to God's command. God's assigned you a purpose. God's given you something to accomplish. God has placed you on this earth for an extreme purpose, to give Him glory. I'm talking to someone here today who knows they have a destiny. I believe that. I believe you know there's a reason and a purpose for your existence, but you just haven't allowed God to have what He's ordained for you. There's something that He's called every one of us to. There's an assignment He's placed in our life. If, if you don't hear me today, then this sermon's probably not for you. But I'm going to tell you something. This sermon's for someone who won't give in, who won't give up, who won't quit, who won't close the door on God. If you're satisfied with where you are right now, if you're satisfied with what you've got right now, if you're happy with what you're doing and what you're experiencing, then maybe this message isn't for you. But if you want more, if you want to serve God in a different way, if you want to see God work, remember every promise and every dream comes with a price. It will cost you something. It will take your energy. It will take your time. There's no victory without a fight. There's no testimony without a test. There's nothing that God wants to do for you more than what He's called you into. But you have to give up something. There's no crown without a cross, no resurrection without a crucifixion. There's nothing that God wants to do for you more than to fulfill everything He's called you to. But between the children of Israel and the promised land was the river Jordan. Too wide. The Jordan River always stands between your promise your assignment, your calling, and you. Here you stand. There's the promise of God. There's the calling of God. And the river's very wide. Can't build a bridge. Don't have a boat. It's what they thought. How are we going to do this? We can see the promised land. How are we going to get there? Step into the water. Start the process. Do you believe God's Word or not? Start walking. Step into it. Start moving in the direction of two things. One, your promise. Second, your challenge. As I said, David ran toward the giant, not away from him. And Joshua was telling the people, step into the water. Step out into it. You can't wait until you see a break in the waves. You can't wait until it makes sense or until it feels good or it's emotionally right. You've got to step into it. You can't wait until you see the waters open up in front of you because they won't. Not until your feet hit the water You've got to get your feet wet. You've got to step into the things that frighten you sometimes, that make you uncomfortable. God says it's time to take the training wheels off. He said it's time to get rid of the pacifiers and the crutches. Time to move from sight to faith. Time to move, move from I hope so to I know so because the Word of God says so. That's where we are. That's where we must be. If 2020 is going to be what it should be, we know that we can walk through a fiery furnace. We know that we can go into the lion's den and not be eaten. We know that we can do the impossible because God has said so. All it takes is a word from God. All it takes. Do you really believe God's word though? And I'm not talking about, you know, I, a lot of people sit around and watch Christian TV all day and hoping that that preacher there will give me a word from God so I'll know what to do. Wait a minute. Turn off the TV. Go to this. Amen. Open it up. Start reading it. There's a word from God. There's a word from God. And then you turn the TV back on once you find the word from God. And that guy on TV, he'll confirm what God's told you. How about that? A lot of people are chasing the spectacular and they're missing the supernatural. Numbers 23, 19. God's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he'll do it. If he's spoken it, he will make it good. You can believe somebody like that. How many got a friend like that? If they say it, you know it's going to come to pass. You know they're going to do it. They're not going to fail. Isn't that wonderful to have a friend? When they stepped into the waters. When they stepped into the waters. David is meditating on this very miracle in Psalm 114. Here's what he said. What's wrong, Red Sea, that made you hurry out of their way? What happened, Jordan River, that you turned away? 
The Message Bible says this, What's wrong with you, sea, that you ran away, and you, River Jordan, that you turned and ran off? Look, look at your life. There's some things that have been chasing you down. If you go to Deuteronomy 28, you'll find that the blessing of God will chase you down if you'll walk in faith. You go And you go on further, and you'll find out that if you don't walk in faith, the other side of that's going to chase you down. So there are a lot of things been chasing you. Maybe it's sickness. Uh, maybe it's uh, debt. I don't know. But there's a turnaround in the atmosphere when we walk with God, when we use our faith. Things begin to change. And you know what? When you step into the water by faith, things are going to be running from you, not running at you. This is the difference. When Carol was diagnosed with cancer in 2005, that's been uh, almost 15 years ago now. In fact, it, it'll be 15 years this month, isn't it? February, February. Felt like the Jordan River was at flood stage when we heard that. And we looked at each other, and she took authority and dominion. She pounded her fist on a table when the... I mean, as soon as she hung up the phone that day after that diagnosis, she said, devil, you will not take my life. Our oldest grandson was seven years old, scared him to death. Never seen his mother take dominion, his grandmother take dominion and authority like that. He ran out of the room like, what's she, who's she yelling at? You will not take my life. Things will run from you, not toward you. When you take authority and dominion, that's in the word of God. So we felt like the Jordan was trying to drown us in a sea of trouble, heartache, and pain. But God sent a woman we had never met. I've told this story some years ago now. A woman we'd never met, never seen. Carol had gone through surgery and uh, was ready to start chemo stuff and all that. Maybe it already started, I don't remember. But anyway, this lady called us out of the blue. I'd never heard her name before. Her name was Gloria. She worked at Mercy. And she said, you don't know me, but I've looked at your insurance, and it's not very good. I said, no, I know that. She said, well, I'd like to talk to you. So we went to her office. She had us fill out some paperwork. God gave us a word, a word that came through someone we'd never met before. This is the miraculous power of God. He gave us a word that he was going to cause a more than enough miracle in our lives. She went through all the processes. He met with abundance, every need we had. In fact, it was well over $100,000 that this lady provided for us through what she did. A lady we'd never seen, never known, never heard of, call us. How could that happen? Somebody call you that just out of the blue that says, I, I want you to come. I'm drawn to you and I want, I want to speak to you. And when we filled it out, God just gave us an absolute miracle of God. Look, we believe the Word of God. We can fight with the Word of God. When you get a word from the Lord, you can fight fear and discouragement and worry and doubt and debt Amen. and sickness and problems with the Word of God. When everything in the natural circumstance contradicts it, when you stay in the Word, when everything that you know in this earth says no, and God's word says yes, will you step into the Jordan? Will you step into the water by faith? Will you say, I know what the word says. I believe your word. We will obey your word. We will do what the word says. And you go from barely making it to more than enough. How many will take that every time? That's the word of God, folks. We move from weeping to rejoicing, from victim to victorious. Poverty and lack and sickness and all of that will run from you, not toward you. Take authority over the enemy of God. I'm telling you, Deuteronomy 28, 7 says, The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee from you seven ways. This is the word of God. The miracle is not in knowing or even believing. The miracle is in the doing. The miracle is getting your feet wet. The miracle is walking by faith into what you don't know. It's, it's uncertain. You're not sure of it. And too many people are so analytical that they can't believe the Word of God because they see what they see. The Bible said the priests not only put their feet in the water, but they kept moving. Now it's up to their knees. And that raging river is now up to their waist. 
And they're going, Are you sure, God? God? Hello, God? They're kind of like the guy who was walking on a cliff, on a little narrow road, slipped, fell down, hundreds of feet below, hundreds of feet below. He grabbed hold of one little limb, and he's hanging there, just kind of swinging. And he's yelling, God, help, help, anybody? Anybody hear me? Hello? Nothing. He goes back to God again. God? God, if you're there, would you help me? A voice from the heavens. Yes, I hear you. Just do what I say. Let go of the limb. There's a pause. Can anybody else hear me? Help. We don't want to get into the water that far. It's amazing how last minute God is, isn't it? He's just kind of like, God, why didn't you show up earlier? I thought it was drowning, Lord. God is saying, just check in your level of trust. Just check in your faith thermometer. Just seeing if you really did believe me. So when you step into the water, you can't stop. But at some point, they began to think, oh, we must be going higher because the water seems to be receding. Oh, wait, the water's actually backing up. Oh, wait, oh, wait. There's dry ground here. What? Now, when the water receded, don't you think the ground would have been wet? They're just another little small miracle. Don't want you guys to get your feet muddy, God said, so I'm going to dry the ground out. How's that? With God, all things are possible to him that believeth. Amen. I'm not telling you anything that's not in the Word of God. Do you know that? And while the priest stood in the middle of the Jordan, holding up the ark, two to three million people. Now, how long did that take? There's another miracle here. How many tried to hold something up for a while? I don't know how long it took for two to three million people to go through on dry ground. They held that ark up. While the priests were lifting God up in the middle of the Jordan on dry ground, millions of people came through because of the praise of the priests. Lifting up the ark, lifting up the arms, lifting up the hands, lifting up the praise. Listen, somebody's coming through their problem because of your testimony. Somebody's coming through their problem because of your praise. Somebody's coming through because you know God. Somebody is listening to you. Your voice, your witness, doing what was impossible to do. God saw that it would come to pass. I believe somebody that wasn't going to make it because of your testimony will now make it. Somebody because you praised God for what he's done in your life and you've shared your testimony with them. You can praise them in the prison. You can praise them in the lion's den. You can praise them in the fiery furnace. Testify and lift him up. It's exactly what was happening. Somebody's life depends on what we do. I may be going through the valley of the shadow of death. And somebody is thanking God Standing with me and lending their faith to mine. Somebody is going through problems with their family or job and our faith will bring them through it. Somebody is trying to destroy your life, but you're going to trust him anyway and God's going to see you through. This is the testimony. God has been and is faithful. Amen. How many of you would raise your hand and say, God has been faithful to me and I can point to a specific moment in my life when I've seen the faithfulness of God? Testimonies will speak out, you know. Testimony is, I didn't drown. I wasn't eaten alive. I didn't burn up. Acts 16 is a good example. So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. We're talking about Paul and Silas, right? Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were just listening. Didn't say they joined in. They're just right there beside them, listening. They had no choice. They're all, <laughs> they're all there in that small place. They're praying, singing hymns to God. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors flew open and the change of every prisoner fell off. Hmm. 
That's interesting, isn't it? Earthquake that shook the foundations. Doors flew open. Why? How? I mean, no, we don't ask how. Sometimes we don't even ask why. We just know that we trust God. And you know what? I love this part in Joshua. They made it through, but there was no evidence or residue or lingering after effects that they had just been through what they went through as they walked through the Jordan. Dry ground. No mud. No lingering effects. Like it never happened. How many of you seen that little commercial that have been running lately? Like it never happened. They're fixing a car, you know, whatever. And they're saying, like it never happened. This is exactly it. Just like the three Hebrew children, they came out of the furnace. They didn't smell like smoke. I'm telling you. All the Israelites passed through on dry ground. Why? Because the miracle of God and God's ready to do a miracle for any of us in this place today if we'll trust him for it. Remember, all this started when the priests obeyed the Lord and stepped into the water by faith in his word. It takes big obedience along with big faith to step toward the problem, to run toward the giant. But when you do, God will part the waters from you. He'll part the waters and give you a dry place to walk. He'll give you no residue. He'll give you like it never happened. He'll, he'll let you look back and go, wow, look what God did. Wow, look what the miracle of God was all about. Look, look at what God did in my life. Look at how he changed things in our family. This box right here. In fact, the folks from Minnesota said we got some names to come and put in the box today. They brought them with them. Glory to God. Like it never happened. These children are coming to the Lord. They're going to know the truth of the word of God. They're going to come back to God. They're going to find God. These family members, these brothers and sisters and moms and dads, they're coming. Look, when you step toward the problem, when you run toward the giant, God will part the waters. God will give you the stones and the sling. God will bring the victory. Even though you're outmanned and outgunned and everybody around you says, no, that can't happen. Everybody near you says, you're crazy for believing that. Keep dreaming big. Keep believing big. Keep obeying big. This is what God wants for every one of us. Use your faith. Expect the miracle of God. I can't tell you that that Carol and I were absolutely, completely, 100% sure. We hadn't looked at each other at times, and, and we said, boy, how are we going to pay these bills? And they're laying there on the desk. You're looking at them. And then we said, boy, we're going to do some of these treatments, but we're believing God. We're going to use the scientific knowledge we're going to use the wisdom of God. Where do you think the name of this church came from? The wisdom that God gives. And we're going to use our faith. We're going to believe God. We're going to believe God for his healing power. Fifteen years later, here she is. No cancer. Glory to God. And I tell you about her faith, I've told you before, and we, we were kind of doing that then. Every bills would come in. There have been times in our life where we've had very little. We've always believed God for provision. Times in our life when Carol would write the check, <laughs> put it in an envelope, address it, and stamp it, but not mail it. There's not enough money in the bank. That's the way we approached. She's pretty particular about her mail. In fact, I... She does have faith, and I'll tell you how I know. She's willing to drop it in a mailbox. You say, well, how's that faith? Well, what she'd really like to do in her own flesh is to wait at the mailbox till the postman came to get it, and she'd like to follow him down to the main station, and she'd like to be sure that it got in the right slot and get on the plane with it and fly it to the place it's going and follow the truck over to where and be sure it's delivered in that mailbox, the correct one. That's flesh. That's what you like to do. And I use that as an example because we're all that way to some degree about something in our lives. We're all, we all want to manage it. We want to manage what happens to it. We want to manage the way it comes to be. We, we want to control things. Faith is saying, God, I can't do it anyway. I'm going to trust you. I've read enough of your word where I can release this. There's some folks who need to let it go today. 
folks in this room today who need to release it before 2020 so that in that release, there's clarity and you know that God's got it. God's got it. I believe you can trust God more than the U.S. Postal Service. How many believe that? But you still let go of your mail, don't you? You put it in the slot and you believe. I can trust God more than I can trust them. God never makes a mistake. He never puts it in the wrong box. He never sends it to the wrong address. See, that's what faith is. Faith is saying, God, I trust you to the degree more than I trust the U.S. Postal Service. I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to release it to you. I'm going to turn it over to you because I can't, I can't do it. It's got to be you. I'm going to use big faith and big obedience, and I'm going to do what the Word of God says. And in my doing, in my, when I get my feet wet, there's my trust, Lord. And I'm going to keep walking. Even if the water gets up to here, I'm going to still believe. I'm going to believe that you've said it and that you will not fail me. Hallelujah. Anybody here in agreement with me? Well, stand up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to take that piece of mail. How do you hold a piece of mail like this, right? We're going to take this and we're going to release it to the Lord in a minute. I want you to think about it. I want you to hold it like you'd hold a piece of mail. I'm going to pray and we're going to believe God. And when you open your fingers, you're saying, I'm letting this go. I'm giving this to God because I trust Him more than I trust the postal service. Whatever's in your life, whatever's the problem in your physical body, in your finances, in your family, in your relationships, whatever that is, whatever you're trusting God for, whatever you feel like you've heard from God, from His Word, to, to, to be able to release to Him, the promise of God, you're standing at the, the, the edge of the Jordan right now. And when you release this, I believe you're going to feel your feet get wet. I believe you're going to say, I release this, Lord. I'm walking toward the problem. Father, in Jesus' name now, we believe your word. Lord, we have big faith today and we have now big obedience. We're going to release from our hands what we've tried to hold on to and solve the problem. But Lord, we, we've not done a good job of solving that problem because it's going to take a miracle. So Lord, we're praying right now for miracles in this room. Miracles that you promised in your word. So when we line those up, we know that we have to let go so you can do what you do. But Lord, we want to follow completely what you've told us to do. So in the name of Jesus now, we release from our hands into yours those things that we can't accomplish on our own anyway. Let's use our faith, folks. Release that in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that we've released. And we praise you now for victory in situations and circumstances in this earth. Oh, Lord, you are supernatural. And we claim your supernatural power in our lives today. Thank you, Lord, that we've released you by trusting you, honoring you in Jesus' name. We give you glory and praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Will you bow your heads with me for just a moment, Lord? It's Christmas season, New Year coming. Maybe there's someone here today who would say, Gary, I, I really want a new year. I really want a new beginning. I really want a new look. I really want something different than the way I've been living before. And I need God to help me do that. Tried to do it on your own, but it hasn't worked. God has this for you. He said... No weapon formed against you. Even weapons that you've formed in your own life. No addiction. No relationship. No trouble will stand. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. This is the promise of God. Raise your hand in this building. You say, I need to be released from some trouble in my life. I've not lived in 2019 like I want to live and. I want 2020 to be different. Thank you. All over the building, there's hands up. Jesus. Lord, you see, this is not a new resolution, Lord. This is a new commitment. It's a new determination. Lord, I pray for every hand raised in this place that by the power and the Spirit of God that you will bring answers and that you will bring strength 
of spirit to stay with it, to not give up, to not look back, to say, I'm going forward. I'm stepping into the water. I'm claiming for my life. I'm claiming a difference. I'm claiming clarity of vision. And in the name of Jesus, I proclaim it over my life. Say this with me, everybody in the building. I thank you, Lord, for the miracles that you're about to create in my life on a daily basis. I will follow you and your instructions, and I will step in to the water. I will get my feet wet and my knees and my waist if necessary, because God, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Give God praise. Give Him honor. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. We're built up by the Word. Our faith is built by the Word. Thank God for the Word today. In Jesus' name.